Hello students, welcome back. Let us continue our discussion on the properties of simple mixtures and today's topic is numerical problems on simple mixtures. So, the first problem that I have chosen to discuss with you is checking the validity of Raoult's law and Henry's law. So, let me read out the problem for you. The vapor pressures of each component in a mixture of acetone and chloroform are measured at 35 degree centigrade and these pre vapor pressures are tabulated below. So, I am going to use this notation that A stands for acetone and C stands for chloroform. So, as you see that at a given temperature I have fixed the temperature. So, for this mixture now I can uh, I have an option to use a second independent variable and that is the mole fraction of one of the components. So, in this uh, experiment they have used the mole fraction of chloroform as the independent variables and they have made 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 solutions. So, what is the composition of the first solution? For the first solution you have x c equal to 0. Then what is x a? x a is equal to 1. So, this is pure acetone. Okay. Now, look at the second solution. Then I have mole fraction of chloroform as 0.2. So, what is the mole fraction of a in that case? 0.8. So, this way all the 6 solutions have been uh, prepared with increasing the mole fraction of chloroform from 0 to here 1.0. So, at 1.0 I have pure chloroform right because x a under this condition is 0, 0.0. Okay. So, what I will do is next I will show you the partial vapor pressure of chloroform in the vapor that is present in equilibrium with the liquid mixture. This partial vapor pressure is as measured is 0. Obviously, uh, you do not have any chloroform in the liquid mixture and therefore, the vapor that is uh, above the liquid mixture is devoid of any chloroform and therefore, its partial pressure is 0. Now, as you go on increasing the mole fraction of chloroform in the liquid, you see that there is a substantial increase in the partial vapor pressure of chloroform in the uh, vapor phase. Similarly, when I am talking about the partial vapor pressure of acetone, I find that this is the solution where I have pure acetone and here the partial vapor pressure of uh, uh, acetone is the highest because that corresponds to the partial vapor pressure of pure acetone. And as I progress then the uh, solution now is acetone rich because it is 80 percent by mole fraction of acetone, but it is decreasing from its pure value. And as you go uh, on the uh, towards the right for the final solution its partial pressure is going to be 0 because I do not have any more acetone left in the solution. Okay. So, the question that I am posing here is as follows. Confirm that the mixture conforms to the Raoult's law for the component in large excess and Henry's law for the minor component. Now, to solve this problem the first thing that you must realize is looking at the data and identify what is the major component or the component in large excess which is acting conventionally as the solvent. Okay. So, if I am looking at this region which one is the major component obviously acetone is in excess over here. So, this 
uh, these two solutions may be up to here, we can say this is a solution of chloroform in acetone, where chloroform acts as the solute and acetone is in excess and hence acts as a solvent. But if I am at the two data points later on, then what is in excess over here? Here I have chloroform in excess okay? and therefore, I can say that in this region, I am describing the solution of acetone as solute in chloroform as solvent. Therefore, while working to solve this problem, we need to uh, focus on these two extreme regions where I have the composition either uh, looking at acetone as excess or chloroform as excess. So, moving ahead, there are other things that I notice. The first thing that I notice over here is that the vapor pressure of pure chloroform. Can you tell me what the vapor pressure of pure chloroform is? Of course, I can. I look for the data point where pure chloroform is present and that must be x c is equal to 1.0. What is the vapor pressure, uh, partial vapor pressure of the solution then? 36.4 kilo Pascal and therefore, this must be corresponding to the partial pressure of pure uh, vapor pressure of pure chloroform because it is a one component system under such circumstances and therefore, I would say P c star for the pure phase is 36.4 kilo Pascal. Now, if I look at this data now and I try to plot, this would be the plot of partial vapor pressure of chloroform as a function of mole fraction of chloroform. Okay? And here I am plotting the experimental data points which are uh, shown over here. Okay? They have been plotted as these points in the graph and they have been connected by a line just as a guide to our eyes. Okay. Now, moving ahead from here, then we also know that I can use the same data set to find out for instance, the vapor pressure of pure acetone. Now, in this entire data set, where do I have data on pure acetone. Here I have presented the data in terms of x a. So, x a equal to 1.0 obviously tells me that this is the sample where I have pure acetone and therefore, the vapor pressure of pure acetone is 46.3 kilo Pascal. Now, if I go ahead and plot this, I get a very similar curve uh, to that uh, I obtained for chloroform at the same temperature. And here the experimental data points as you see have been plotted as these red points and they have been connected by a curve once again as a guide to your eyes. Now, when I go back and combine the uh, two sets of data, then as you understand that I need only one mole fraction to describe the composition of the solution and I have two sets of vapor pressures as shown here which have been measured in our experiment. Okay? Now, what I do is I put them in the same plot. So, what is this line connecting the blue dots represent? They represent the uh, partial vapor pressure as measured for the chloroform and these lines connecting the red dots show us the partial vapor pressure of A as measured in my experiment. But you might wonder that in the previous slide the curve for A did not look like this. I would say please look at what you are plotting along the x axis. You are plotting along x axis the mole fraction of C. Therefore, whatever I was plotting for C that remains the same, but what is the mole fraction 
of A, mole fraction of A is related to the mole fraction of C. So, here if I am plotting x c going from 0 to 1, how will x a vary? x a will vary from 1 to 0 and that is exactly what you have seen over here. It is just the reversal of the axis for the acetone component over here. Okay? So, this is how the measured vapor pressure of each component in a mixture of acetone and chloroform looks uh, uh, like at 35 degrees centigrade. Now, moving ahead, I go back to the data of chloroform and I understand that if the uh, chloroform vapor is uh, behaving ideally or in other words, if I have an ideal solution following Raoult's law, then what would be PC ideal? I can find out PC ideal in terms of the mole fraction x c multiplied by the vapor phase, uh, uh, the partial vapor pressure, the uh, vapor pressure of the pure chloroform. So, P c ideal would be given by x c into P c star and here therefore, for each of these solutions, I can calculate the partial vapor pressure of the component c if I have an ideal solution following the Raoult's law. So, 0 into P c star that is going to be 0. How did I get this value? All I have done is I have taken x c equal to 0 0.2 then multiplied it with P c star equal to 36.4 and the answer is 7.28 kilo Pascal. So, this way I could go ahead and calculate all the partial pressures that I needed if the solution followed Raoult's law. Now, if I go ahead and plot the partial vapor pressure of chloroform in the same uh, plot and compare it with the experimental data. So, now what you see here is these are the measured values, okay? these blue dots connected by the red curve and the black line over here is what the partial vapor pressure was supposed to be if the solution was ideal. Okay? Now, what is it that we have learned from here? We have learned that in the, this experiment, this is the region where chloroform is in excess and acting as a solvent. And I find that in the range where the mole fraction x c is uh, uh, pretty large implying that c is in excess and acts as a solvent. This is the region where we should focus our attention while checking the validity of Raoult's law for chloroform. And what is our observation? Our observation is there is a marked deviation from the Raoult's law uh, in our experiment even when x c is greater than 0 0.9. But uh, we do see that very close to 1, our experimental results actually go towards the values predicted by Raoult's law. And this is a typical observation when you have real solutions. Now, if I look at the, uh, if I just repeat the same analysis with acetone. So, here what you have is a pair of curves for the component A, where the red dots connected by the curve, the uh, red curve, this is the measured partial vapor pressure of chloroform, uh, of sorry, acetone. And the purple line is what is predicted to be the partial vapor pressure of acetone from Raoult's law. Okay? And here again, I found find that this is the region where A is in excess and once more irrespective of which component that I am using here, I find that there is substantial deviation from the Raoult's law in the intermediate zones and a, re, a range of mole fraction and both the components 
obey Raoult's law for a large excess of the respective component in the region where the uh, its mole fraction is very close to 1. Now, moving ahead, if I want to check the application of Henry's law, then what will happen? We will have to choose the range of mole fraction of xi, where the component i is less and acts as a solute. Okay. So, for chloroform, I will have to choose this region. If I am working with acetone, I will have to choose this region. Okay. Then what we will do is, we will plot a straight line that is tangent to the plot of p i versus x i for low values of x i. So, I am going to draw a tangent line to this region very close to the, uh, uh, the pure uh, uh, chloroform range and obtain uh, the straight line and find out its slope. And what would be the slope of this line? this line is going to give me the Henry's law constant. And if you do this experiment, uh, do this analysis of the experimental data over here, you will find that for acetone, uh, this is where the acetone acts as a solute. And if you obtain the slope of the straight line, uh, uh, slope of the curve very close to uh, uh, this plot uh, near uh, x a equal to 1. Uh, uh, so, for very small values of uh, x a, then you will find that the slope is equal to 23.3 kilo Pascal. That says that the Henry's law constant for acetone is 23.3 kilo Pascal. And for chloroform, if you just go here where it acts as a solute, then what happens is you can find out that k h that is a Henry's law constant for acetone is 22.0 kilo Pascal. Okay. Now, this brings us to the last part of the analysis that is there are se several uh, thermodynamic quantities that we are looking at when we are uh, looking into the problem of mixing. So, let us talk about what is the change in Gibbs free energy. Uh, when we are mixing two liquids to form an ideal solution. So, as before, we would think of the system before mixing and after mixing. Okay. So, before mixing, I had two pure liquids A and B maintained at the same temperature T and after mixing, let us say that I have an ideal solution obeys Raoult's, obeying Raoult's law. So, this ideal solution is A plus B. So, my question is can I evaluate the uh, free energy of mixing for a situation like this? Obviously, I need to understand the Gibbs free energy initial state where I had the two pure liquids separately. So, if I had Na moles of the pure liquid A and Nb moles of the pure liquid B separately, then G initial must be equal to N A into mu A star plus N B into mu B star. So, what is mu A star? That is the chemical potential of the liquid pure liquid A and this is the chemical potential of the pure liquid B. Now, what is the Gibbs free energy in the final ideal solution? That must be N A mu A plus N B mu B. So, here mu A corresponds to the chemical potential of the component A in the ideal solution. Similarly, mu B is the chemical potential of the component B in the solution. And so, since they are in the liquid mixture right now, I have removed the subscript, uh, superscript star from here. So, how is mu A or mu B, mu A related to mu A star? This is what I have written down here because mu I is equal to mu I star plus R T L n X i, where X i is the mole fraction of the ith component in the liquid mixture. Okay. Now, using these two results, I can very easily write down that 
I will put back the expression of mu i into this expression. So, I will have n a into the relationship of mu a to its chemical potential in the pure phase plus r t into logarithm of its mole fraction in the solution phase and similarly for the component b. Once I do this, I can just collect the terms similar looking terms and I take out the total number of moles present in the final mixture which is n and that must be equal to Na plus Nb. And therefore, just like the ideal gas mixture, I can say that the free energy of mixing of two liquids to form an ideal solution depends on Xa ln Xa plus Xb ln Xb. And since it is an ideal solution, then delta H mix is going to be equal to 0. And in that case, delta S mix that is the entropy of mixing can be very easily obtained as minus nr xa ln xa plus xb ln xb. But uh, interestingly, as we have already seen, most of the solutions are not ideal. So, then let us take up the problem of finding free energy of mixing when two liquids are mixed to form an ideal dilute solution, whereby the solvent is ideal, but the solute follows uh, Henry's law. Okay, the solvent follows uh, Raoult's law, but the solute follows Henry's law. In that case, what happens is you have the same expression for G initial, you have the same expression for G final, but and mu A because of the fact that it is still following Raoult's law, I can write down as mu A star plus R T L N X A, but now I will have to do something else about the solute B. Now, solute B follows the Henry's law and we have already seen in that case mu B would be equal to mu B naught plus R T L N X B and mu B naught is mu B star plus R T logarithm of a, of a ratio which is the Henry's law constant for B divided by the vapor pressure of the pure B under the same temperature. So, now the task is very simple. I am going to replace the mu A in this equation by this expression and I am going to replace mu B in this expression by this relationship. And when I do that, I can find out that G final now turns out to be an expression like this. I am going to collect some of the terms and rewrite the G final as N A mu A star plus N B mu B star plus some other things. Okay. Now, as you see what is this quantity? This is a long equation, complicated equation, but I know that I can simplify this. The first step in the simplification is identification of the fact that this term is nothing but G initial. If that is so, I can write down the G final as G initial plus these additional terms. So, immediately I can say that since uh, the free energy of mixing is G final minus G initial, therefore, I must be having the free energy of mixing is equal to N A R T L N X A plus N B R T L N X B plus one additional term. Now, as you see that this can be simplified even more. How do I uh, simplify it even more? I understand that these two terms that I have, they can be collected. I can take N R T out where N is the total number of moles that is N A plus N B. So, what am I left with? I am left with X A L N X A plus X B L N X B and plus some additional term. Now, do you know what this term is? This is nothing but in, uh, in, uh, give, uh, gives free energy of mixing for an ideal solution. 
So, that is exactly what I have written down. So, the free energy of mixing in an ideal dilute solution is equal to the free energy of mixing in an ideal solution plus an additional term. So, experimentally when you work with an ideal dilute solution, what you do is you uh, instead of writing down explicitly what this additional term is, people have used, they have identified this quantity as a quantity which depends on the composition of the liquid mixture. Okay. Then they have gone ahead and written down that the free energy of mixing of an ideal dilute solution that must be the free energy of mixing of the ideal solution plus an additional term dependent on x a and x b, but now I have a new parameter xi. Okay. So, basically what I am doing is I am trying to understand that having a real solute following the Henry's law is actually providing an additional contribution to the free energy of mixing. Okay. So, what will the uh, quantity xi represent? The quantity xi actually represents the change in the underlying property of the solution because of uh, the fact that there is interaction between the molecules of A and B. Okay. So, this is the strength of interaction that is causing the uh, free energy of mixing in an ideal dilute solution to deviate from that predicted by the uh, free energy of mixing in an ideal solution. So, if we uh, look at the experimental uh, measurements of how this free energy of mixing of uh, ideal dilute solutions vary, as you see that I am plotting x a uh, along the x axis, the free energy of uh, mixing along the y axis and as you see for different values of xi, these are the behavior of the free energy of mixing. So, the underlying reason why they uh, it shows so much deviation from the ideal gas behavior, uh, ideal solution behavior is because now the enthalpy of mixing is no longer equal to 0. And that is exactly what is shown on the right and that tells you that there is a significant deviation of the enthalpy directly representing the different extents of interaction between the molecules of A and B in our system of interest. So, that is all for today and uh, that concludes our discussion on non-reactive uh, mixtures where we have talked about ideal gas mixtures. Uh, ideal solutions and ideal dilute solutions. Thank you.